I can hear you well, yeah. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, thanks everyone for having me tonight and Natasha for inviting me to do this webinar. Uh, as she said, it is my first webinar, so uh, this is very exciting. Um, the information obviously is not uh, new um, for myself to deliver, but maybe new for some of you. So hopefully everyone will get a little bit of something out of this. Like she said, it is sort of ground level. So we're going to talk to, um, you know, basic nutrition for this um, particular age group. Um, and uh, so, yeah, fire questions throughout. I'll, I'll get, we will get Natasha to moderate those. Um, and uh, whether we can do them throughout or hold them to the end, we can just see how, how things go. So um, I will just get rolling. She already gave my introduction as to the sport teams I'm working with. So uh, I did start with the center last June. So I've been working with them for almost about a year now. It's been fantastic. So uh, what I want to cover tonight, uh, a few different areas. Starting with what are the energy demands for this uh, population and as an athletic group, looking at the importance of hydration and how coaches, athletes, what they need to be aware of and how we can really support them in that. I will touch a little bit on fueling for training. So really helping your athletes understand the importance of timing, what they need to be having um, before coming to training and or competition, uh, looking at what they might need to be doing during, depending on the sport, length of uh, activity, etc., and then how they need to properly recover so that they're getting the most out of their out of their exercise, and then looking at how coaches and parents um, can play a role. I'm not sure if there are any parents on the call tonight, but uh, if so, then this will uh, be helpful for you as well. I have this sort of theme threaded throughout the entire webinar anyway, but uh, just a few key points, I guess, toward the end on some additional things coaches can do to help play a role. So looking at proper nutrition, um, it's kind of a unique age group because they really are in a critical stage of growth and development. So we're sort of thinking about that 12 to, to 17 year old age group, so adolescents and teens. So they do have uh, quite a bit of growth and development yet to uh, undergo. So meeting those needs through proper nutrition is going to be really important. And then looking at the next step is them being athletes, right? So we need to make sure that they have everything for baseline and then all the extra that they're going to need to be able to perform uh, as well as they need to in their sport. So proper nutrition, like I said, maintaining that normal growth and development that's happening. Uh, for example, like bone mass is really built in this um, <clears throat> in this age group. So making sure we have proper nutrition to, to facilitate that is really important. We need to make sure that they're meeting their overall energy and micronutrient needs, so things like vitamins and minerals. So not just uh, their overall caloric intake, but making sure that they're getting all the small bits in there as well for that growth and development. We need to make sure that they are adequately um, hydrated, so supplying the right kinds of fluids at the right time, knowing what those are. So I will touch a little bit on things like sports drinks, energy drinks, uh, and really how they can either help or hinder things like um, hydration. We want to make sure that they have an immune system that is good and strong. So the healthier they are, the more time they're going to be able to train. Um, if they're out of training, obviously their performance can thus be impaired. So we want to make sure that our athletes are very healthy throughout all of their training competitions. We need to make sure that it's the, the nutrition they're getting is acting as a fuel supply to not just the muscles that are performing the work, but to their brain as well. So they are going to school, they're doing other things as well as being an athlete. So we need to make sure all that is uh, properly fueled and then refueling the body after training and competitions before and before future events. So making sure that we're really maximizing that recovery period so that um, they are seeing that to enhance training response and being able to perform at the level that we want them to be. So quality is of the utmost importance and we will talk about that throughout the webinar. So just a few points that may or may not be new to some of you out there, but we know that really only about 10% of kids are really getting enough fruits and vegetables. That's gonna be really critical uh, in the fact that it supplies a lot of those um, really important micronutrients that they're gonna need for growth and development. Our Canadian teens are drinking almost two liters of sugary drinks every day. So things like pop, juice, sports drinks, energy drinks are some of the more popular ones. They're very easily con uh, convenient, they're accessible, you know, they use them for pick-me-ups, whatnot. Um, unfortunately, they're just really, really uh, nutrient-poor and providing a lot of sugar for our teens. 
And then one in three teens does eat out at a fast food restaurant on a daily basis. So our food system is unfortunately just set up um, for convenience and a lot of the um, adolescent athletes are taking advantage of some of the less than um, nutritionally adequate sources around them. So whether they're picking food up on the way out of training or you know going out with lunch for their friends, we can see that some of these habits in our athletes are um, are happening and we need to be able to really um, try to replace these processed foods with more real foods because we know it's arguably really the best way to improve the health of our adolescents performance in sports so um, just being mindful of that because we are seeing a rise in things like type 2 diabetes and blood pressure in um, in this adolescent group so that does really affect uh, their performance in the long run so I really do like this visual and I, I do show it a lot to um, athletes themselves so that they can be really self-aware and I think it's really important for coaches to be aware of some of the things that they may um, either hear or see in some of their athletes as a result of a couple of things. A, not getting enough calories, so enough energy to supply um, their body with everything it needs for this growth and development and then the performance. Um, but also all the, micro, or the micronutrient needs, so that quality is not quite there. So this is a slide um, showing the potential performance effects of relative energy deficiency in sport, or REDS. And what that is is really an inclusive description of this entire uh, cluster of physiological complications that we see in athletes who habitually underconsume um, intakes and they're really not meeting the needs for optimal body function once the energy cost of exercise has been removed and this might not be something that they're doing consciously it can be a matter of just a couple of hundred calories which really is really a snack so uh it's not uncommon for athletes to be under consuming just because they're unaware of how much they actually need um given the the stage of growth that they're in or the sport that they're in and how intense it might be or the time of training in the season. So a lot of these things um, may pop up, but athletes aren't aware that they could be very well related to nutrition. So I think as a coach, it's important to be mindful of some of these things and um, that may show up and think about them as a, being a red flag and having those conversations about nutrition or, um, you know, having having um, them speak to a dietitian uh, if a lot of these things pop up, whether it's one or a number of them. So things like impaired immunity. So maybe you have an athlete that often gets sick. Um, maybe they're at an increased uh, injury risk. So they have a chronic or recurring injury that just won't heal. And we can't figure out why, no matter if they're you know, taking care of it with therapy. Um, they could have decreased coordination or concentration or impaired judgment. So depending on the sport, maybe if it's basketball per se, they're not able to uh, play with the team well, they're not shooting very well, so things like that could be off. Maybe they're irritable or they're just not getting better in training and you're not understanding why considering all the hours that they put in and all the work that they're doing. So a lot of these things, um, not to say that they're always related to nutrition, but it certainly does play a factor. So I think being aware of those uh, as a coach and, and parent uh, can be important so that you can have those conversations with your athletes. But how much do they really need? This is really an estimation. It's certainly by no means an exact calculation of how much energy or calories that this age group needs, uh, as every individual is different. And that is going to be based on their age, their gender, their weight, what sport they're in, how intense they're um, exercising. So the point, uh, I guess the take home point with this particular slide here is just to show how much extra energy um, and active female or male might need compared to their sedentary counterpart. So it can be minimum five, 600 calories extra every single day to account for that extra work that they're putting in. So again, the numbers are, are very estimated, but knowing that it, it is above and beyond what someone their same age would need if they were just a, you know, recreational athlete or participating in gym, you know, a couple times a week would need. So being aware of a coach and I think as parents to really understanding that your athletes, you know, are that hungry all the time for a reason, or they do need those extra couple of snacks. So we need to be able to account for that uh, is really important. And, and having them be aware of how much extra they really do need in the run of a day to uh, supply the needs for training. So how can we 
account for the extra calories or where do where they need to come from? No, you're going to dash it. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, how, how can we help athletes achieve that? Well, a Canada's food guide is a good start. Uh, it is just that it is a guide. Um, so I'm sure most of uh, coaches are very familiar with this particular document and most athletes are as well. Fortunately, it doesn't really cut it for athletes uh, due to their increased energy demands, as we talked about, but it's a great starting block for um, understanding good food habits, uh, where good quality food can come from and how much they might need. So it's certainly a good tool to use with athletes if they need some guidance on um, how to meet their nutritional needs. And then we sort of have to take it one step further uh, when it comes to that athletic population. So if we go to the next slide, we kind of have set up a food guide for athletes. So when I talk to athletes and coaches, we really have to show them how much extra they're going to need from each of the food groups. Some of them more than others. Some can be pretty much the same. Um, and again, uh, similar to the energy slide, this is very, an, very much an estimated number. So this is going to be different for every single athlete, but it's just to show that it, uh, it is that much more specifically from a couple of different food groups. Um, I really like to touch on the, the grains and starches with athletes and get them to understand that, I guess sometimes as sports dietitians, we lump in uh, our starches with grains where the food guide doesn't. So things like potatoes and corn that are gonna provide them with a higher amount of carbohydrates, we throw in that, uh, in that food group as well. And vegetables will be more than your non your non starchy vegetables. We also, excuse me, talk about this extra category, which really is anything that's going to have added sugar, that'll provide calories for them. So honeys, maple syrup, jam, um, things like granola bars or sports bars that have some added sugar in there would kind of fall in that category as well. And we have that on there for athletes because of their increased energy demands, and it's going to be hard. For some of them to get that through all of the other food groups alone so there really is a time and place for those types of foods they're certainly not what we want to uh, base the majority of their diet on we want to get it from the most wholesome foods possible from all of the other food groups but in and around training and we'll talk about that there is a place for some of those um, just um, I guess empty calories to some degree um, to just supply that quick energy that is needed and make sure that they're meeting those overall um, energy intakes for the whole day so that they're not in that deficit. And what athletes can do is just reference the food guide when it comes to servings because that is based on number of servings from each of the food groups. So I would just um, um, use the food guide as that reference rather than go through serving sizes with everyone tonight. All right, so... I just want to quickly touch on our macronutrients, so looking at carbs, proteins, fat. So how much does your athlete actually need? A general block guideline for moderate uh, to intense training would be that uh, we, as I guess as sports dietitians, we use um, grams per kilogram body weight a lot when we're talking about the needs of these specific nutrients to our athletes. Uh, as coaches, that is a, a bit specific. So I think the the main take home is really knowing that carbohydrates, because they are the main source of energy for your athletes, really no matter what um, sport they're participating in, um, I think the amount that they would have would differ, uh, be different depending on the sport. But overall, our bodies want to use carbohydrates the most. So uh, having your athletes understand that carbohydrates are really important and it shouldn't be something they're skimping out on to, uh, to try to increase um, other nutrients is really important. Our adolescents really do need to get about 45 to 65 percent of their daily intake of calories from carbohydrates, and we want to see that come from the most wholesome sources possible. So we really want to focus on high fiber grains, so rice, quinoa, whole grain breads, things like that, our starches, like I said, potatoes or corn, vegetables and fruit, really important, as, again, for those uh, good um, micronutrients as well. Legumes actually provide us with a good source of carbohydrates and they're a nice uh, lower fat option. And then low fat milk and yogurt. So any of our dairy actually provides us with carbohydrate needs, which is always interesting because a lot of athletes, when I ask them where carbohydrates come from, um, that's one of the food groups that often gets forgotten, but it's a great source um, for them as well. We want to limit low quality carbohydrates as much as possible. Um, so candy, soft drinks, 
um, baked goods. So, you know, seeing the athletes um, come out with muffins or croissants and things like that uh, are just low quality choices. If they can be doing sort of homemade options, excuse me, those are always better because they can control what goes in them. So if parents are um, good bakers or if athletes or if coaches like to, to supply um, treats for athletes or trips or whatnot or fundraisers, then um, being able to source some, um, you know, homemade uh, goods are always a little bit better. But timing those around training would be the place that they could fit. Other than that, we really want to focus on um, the most whole, wholesome sources possible. So uh, for protein needs, um, protein needs are generally not hard to get uh, for most athletes. Protein uh, gets highly emphasized by uh, the media and whatnot. So you'll definitely hear, I think, this age group talk a lot about protein. Um, it, it is a certainly uh, an important nutrient. We do need that for building and repairing the body tissue. So uh, all the stress that they're putting their bodies under during training uh, does need to be uh, rebuilt and repaired. So protein is the go-to for that. And they do need more in this age group. Again, like I said, they are going through that uh, growth and development uh, phase. So they are going to need more than, say, their adult counterparts, even ones that are um, potentially training. So we want to focus on whole foods that provide high quality proteins. Um, I'm not going to uh, really touch on things like supplements tonight. So I just want to um, say that athletes can get what they need through high quality protein sources. They don't need to turn to supplements. It can be done through food. It just often takes a little bit more planning uh, to some degree. But any of our meat, poultry, fish, eggs, uh, are going to be um, really bioavailable, so our body is going to absorb that protein, those amino acids, really, really well. So they're fantastic sources of protein. Um, red meat, uh, great to have a couple times a week, especially in that athletic population. Um, the most uh, notable reason really being for uh, the iron content, which I will speak to in a few minutes. Fatty fish, a couple times a week minimum, uh, is really emphasized for athletes. So um, you can let them know that's really important for basically for the omega-3 content is the reason why we really promote that fatty fish um, within the diet and within the weekly diet. It's always great to have athletes try other sources of protein as well, like uh, tofu or beans, lentils. The great thing about these is they not only provide protein for your athletes, but they'll provide them with carbohydrates and fiber as well. And that's really important because uh, adoles adolescents often do fall short on the requirements for fiber. And it's really important for uh, good gut health in, in this population, whether you're an athlete or not. So having that um, through alternative sources of protein is really fantastic. And then of course our dairy products are gonna provide fantastic protein as well. Timing is important, which we will talk about in and around training. And noting that um, the athletes should really be looking at spacing that out through the day is really important. So um, through most times in our meals, it's not hard to get an adequate uh, amount of protein. It doesn't need to be overdone because our body really is only going to absorb about 30 grams uh, at one time. And that's, you can get, I think about 25 to 30 grams in a serving uh, of any of your like poultry or meat. And that's a serving would be about the size of a deck of cards. So the chicken breasts that we buy in the grocery stores today is, and if your athletes are eating one or two of those is, uh, just protein in excess. So knowing that they should space that out through the day, have protein at snacks as well throughout the day uh, is really important for them to for them to know. So then quickly, and I won't spend too much time on it, is uh, the importance of fat. So we know carbs and protein are always the star uh, in most meals and uh, in training, in and around training. But fat is really, really important for things like vitamin absorption, uh, especially of the uh, fat-soluble vitamins A, E, D, and K, uh, of which vitamin D is really important one that I'll touch on here in a few minutes. Uh, it's going to produce hormones. It's going to help reduce inflammation. Again, that omega-3 um, powerhouse. And then building their immune system. So it really, in this population, we want to see about 25 to 35% of their total daily calories coming from fats. Again, quality is important here, so we want to make sure those sources are, um, are of, of the utmost quality. So fatty fish, things like salmon, sardines, 
uh, mackerel, uh, fish oil. So potentially looking at um, supplementation if you have athletes that are vegetarian or vegan or just don't like fish. So, you know, having those conversations and finding out what they like can be uh, helpful to, to know that they might need to look further into getting some of those nutrients. Uh, lean meats and poultry, dairy, things like olives and extra virgin olive oil, and then any of our seeds and nuts and their respective oils are all going to be really good sources of healthy fats. Avocados are in there as well. What we want to see athletes uh, avoiding or limiting, limiting as much as we can would be um, fast food fats, so trying to get them uh, away from the habit of picking up fast food, especially in and around training. Um, fats that you're going to find in baked goods, uh, things like lard and shortenings and butter, and then fat from packaged snack foods or creamy salad dressings, or if they're going to Subway and getting the, you know, the Subway amount of main, regular mayonnaise and things like that on their sub. So just being mindful of, uh, of where the sources of fat should be coming from if athletes um, you know, have questions about that, I think is really important to be able to educate them on the healthiest sources. So that's all really I'm going to say uh, about fat. So just the source is really, really important. So I want to touch on just a couple of micronutrients that are of um, most importance with um, this population. Oh, my slide kind of got messed up. Um, a lot of micronutrients are worth highlighting, but I think in this population um, for athletes, these were three of the, the bigger ones to note. Iron is really going to be uh, crucial for our athletes because it needs it's needed for formation of oxygen carrying proteins. So that makes sure enough oxygen is actually being carried to the working muscles. So if we see um, uh, deficiencies can actually impair muscle function and limit the work capacity. So we do know that boys and girls, uh, nine you know ages nine to thirteen, need about the same amount of iron per day. Uh, but you'll notice that girls actually have an increased need over their uh, over male counterparts, and that's predominantly to do with uh, menstrual function that should start in around that age. So now they're going to need more to account for those losses. So being really mindful of if you have female athletes, that iron levels are something to um, to really note. So that's some, not something you'll be able to know unless they were getting blood work done, but having that in the back of your mind that that could be an issue if you're seeing things like uh, extreme fatigue, irritability, they're, really, uh, they're having a really hard time with training, even if you think that or they report that they're getting sleep or their nutrition is good. So something like low iron um, can be a culprit there. So just being mindful of that, I think, is, is important as a coach. And then our calcium and vitamin D. So those are two um, that I highlight because, again, this uh, age group is um, habitually um, not getting enough vitamin and uh, vitamin D and calcium. Most Canadians really don't get enough calcium, vitamin D, but this population especially, and as athletes, they're going to need, uh, they're really going to need to have strong bones, um, especially depending on the, port, the sport that they are involved in. So it, uh, this age group does need more calcium than adults due to that growth. And like I said, bone mass in this age group is being built for life. I think up to age 21 is when we're going to see the most bone built. So we want to make sure our athletes are getting that adequate source of calcium, vitamin D, which do work together for good bone health. Um, so important to make sure that athletes are consuming calcium rich foods in their diet. You know, oftentimes you're with them frequently so you can see if they are uh, bringing some of these foods. Um, we will talk about timing. So seeing milk and yogurt and cheese, calcium fortified foods around training is really helpful, again, for that protein source as well. Um, Unfortunately, we don't get much vitamin D um, as Canadians from our food supply. It's just it, we don't have it readily available in the foods that we get for the amounts that we know we need. And as athletes, they often are going to need um, amounts and higher amounts than, than adults. So unless they're getting a lot of sunlight exposure, which hopefully we don't want anyone having too, too much, um, they're likely not getting the vitamin D they need. So Things like a supplement with vitamin D uh, might be warranted for um, a lot of athletes. can be something that they can certainly come and check with a dietitian about. Um, 
but it, it's definitely something that they would try to get through food, but may need a little help with. So being mindful that athletes need a little bit more of those um, vitamins and minerals is important. So the next few slides that I have here can be a really helpful way for uh, if athletes see these for them to arrange their plate to help meet their needs uh, or as a coach um, what you can do is um, either educate them uh, on how to arrange their plate to help meet their overall energy needs or just be aware of that you know when you're traveling if you're on the road just taking taking note of what your athletes are eating and what how their plates are made up to know that they're just getting enough of that overall energy they need obviously being aware of quality as well but uh, overall energy uh, is important too. So maybe there it's an easy day or uh, you're in a taper period leading into uh, competition. Um, and that would look like, you can go to the next slide there, Natasha, please, thanks. And that would uh, be represented with a plate looking like this. So ideally half of the plate would be vegetables, uh, a quarter grains and starches, and then a quarter meat and alternatives. Reason for this is they just don't need as much energy if they're not doing as much activity leading up, like if it's a taper or an off season, they're just not going to need the same amount of energy. But they do need quality. So getting lots of vegetables, getting all those micronutrients in will be really important. Throwing a drink on the side, maybe a piece of fruit for dessert. So I'm looking at that as well. If we are exercising, uh, if your athletes are exercising more, so maybe they're doing an hour to two hours of moderate to vigorous activity on a daily basis, their plate needs to change a little bit. And we increase the grains and starches for the reason of added carbohydrates. So grains and starches are gonna be your biggest bang for your buck when it comes to carb content. So we're gonna back off on the vegetables. Again, really important for uh, nutritional quality, but their you know caloric value is a lot less. So we wanna bump that up with grains and starches. Meats and alternatives, the protein source, doesn't need to move because it's not hard to get uh, in our food supply. Unless you, like I said, have athletes that are vegetarian or vegan, which is a whole other topic in itself, but certainly can be done with a little extra planning. And then if we are into an even heavier training block, um, you know, looking at a couple hours of activity, maybe we're doing multiple training sessions per day, they're going to need to change their plate yet again. So making sure your athletes are getting enough of that grains and starches. When I talk to athletes, they often fall short on the recommended needs, especially in these heavy training periods. Um, a lot of the time is because the meat and alternatives is taking up half their plate. So again, protein is uh, overemphasized, but it's easy to get. And the grains and starches often get um, pushed back, which is unfortunate because that's what we know that athletes are going to need to get through all these training sessions and, and uh, have the best performance. So, um, Helping your athletes understand that carbohydrates really are the star of the show most of the time uh, in any training block is really important to help them meet their overall energy needs. So, that's what I have for energy demands. Now I want to look at hydration for the next few minutes. So, Hydration of even, or sorry, dehydration of even a couple percent of body weight can really, really impair performance. A lot of athletes uh, and, and maybe coaches don't know how important um, hydration can be or how easy it is for this population to, uh, to get dehydrated. So consuming enough fluids really is a challenge for a lot of athletes. Uh, it's something I see uh, it's very, very common, especially in younger athletes. They do have a bit of a poor sense of thirst. It's probably in the in the younger uh, the younger end of the age group, not so much in the older teens. But the point is that thirst might not be the best sign of dehydration for some of your athletes. It certainly is one, but there's many others. So um, knowing what those look like in your athletes, I think, can be really important to help them to help educate them on um, the importance of hydration. So maybe they're experiencing headaches, dizziness, you notice that they're really fatigued. Um, again, that concentration uh, is just not there. Maybe they're constantly getting cramps, charley horses, whatnot. 
um, for them being able to assess their own urine color can be something that uh, coaches can educate their athletes on. Um, they often, <laughs> some do it, some just find it really gross when I ask them if they do check their pee uh, in sessions. But because hydration is a very individual thing, it can be uh, an easy way for coaches to tell their athletes um, how to assess their personal hydration status. Once in a while, you'll get an athlete that uh, drinks a lot of fluid and is overhydrated, um, which we don't want either, but that's not often the case. So um, just getting them to, to, to check that and looking for a, like a light yellow or straw colored um, most of the day, especially before uh, and <clears throat> a little bit after training would be what they're looking for. We do know water is going to be the best fluid to quench thirst and to hydrate. Um, and that to promote hydration in some of the younger athletes, uh, it could be helpful to have flavored beverages. So palatability is important. If we want our athletes to drink and they're not really into water and there's no flavor, maybe diluting that with a little juice or, you know, half sports drink, half water uh, might be really um, critical in that particular case to get them to hydrate. So it doesn't always just have to be water. Sometimes we have to, you know, use other measures to make sure that our athletes are hydrated. Um, but there are, you know, and there are situations where uh, if it's an intense activity, maybe you're in a tournament setting, that you're going to require those extra carbohydrates. So something like a juice or a sport drink might actually be very appropriate in that situation, or if it's a hot, uh, hot human environment. So uh, for anyone doing um, football or any of those sports that you might be doing in the summer and wearing quite a bit of equipment, uh, track and field where you're in the heat of the heat of the summer, then um, sports drinks that have electrolytes that need to be replaced would also be a really good thing um, to consider. And we'll chat about that in a second. So just knowing that there are um, times when other drinks come into play because dehydration can significantly impair performance for your athletes. So commercial sports drinks have a place. Um, they're not what I would uh, you know, recommend for athletes to consume all day, every day to help hydrate, but in and around intense activity, like I said, hot human environments. Um, so is, is definitely the place for them. So as a coach, knowing that they are made for the athletic population and that if you see some of your athletes drinking them in around training, uh, it's probably a, a really good thing if they're having them all the time, um, when you're doing, you know, short skills, short sessions, then it's probably just extra calories or um, sugar that your athletes don't really need. Um, but the way they're made up with the types of sugar does help to increase absorption. So they're made very specifically for the athletic population to um, hydrate. So we know that glucose does uh, absorb, uh, is an, a faster absorbing sugar and does help stimulate more uh, net water and sodium absorption than fructose. And they have a certain blend in these sports drinks that um, to help hold water and keep our and keep athletes hydrated. So they uh, they can be very appropriate. And then they contain this the sodium and potassium uh, that are needed to help keep the fluid balance uh, and the body regulated, especially in like I said those hot human environments. Or even if you have uh, an athlete that's just a really intense sweater and it's not even necessarily a long session, but they're an athlete that just uh, you know, sweats heavily, then a sport drink could be something that really does help them uh, minimize that uh, loss of water and dehydration at the end of the training session. I do have a little recipe there for a homemade sport drink. Um, I, I often get athletes to try try them. Some like them, some don't. But you can really pick any uh, any flavor coconut water and 100% fruit juice. Mix equal parts with a sort of a dash of salt. Um, and that can be a nice way to get the similar, you know, a similar combination as you would from a commercial sport drink without the dyes. Uh, and some athletes do find um, commercial sport drink intensely sweet. So, um, you know, having those available for athletes can be really important as well. Energy drinks. I did want to touch on these just briefly, but they're really not ideal for hydration. I know this, uh, this athletic population really does like to consume um, the Red Bulls and the Monsters and whatever else that they're using because they think that sugar and caffeine will really, you know, help them through a training session or help performance. Um, but it's really not uh, shown effective. 
and caffeine can really cause adverse effects in you. So um, Health Canada's recommend a max daily intake of caffeine um, for teens, really at 2.5 milligrams per kilogram of body weight. So that could be one of those energy drinks, but if they're drinking multiple um, drinks per day, they're over-consuming caffeine uh, and they're over-consuming sugar, which is not something that they need at all. And those effects, those adverse effects can be things like upset stomach, anxiousness. They could have trouble sleeping depending on when the drink was ingested, uh, things like faster heart rate and headaches. So there's a lot of complications that can come out of these um, energy drinks when really they're not needed in that population. If they're an athlete that likes to have a cup of coffee in the morning, that's great, that's fine, that amount of caffeine is safe, uh, but combining that with the sugar uh, in the round training is just um, just not ideal for athletes. So some fluid guidelines to help your athletes understand um, how they should be hydrating in round training. It would be a couple hours before they can just have about 500 milliliters of a cold fluid. I say cold just because uh, oftentimes cold is a bit more palatable and will encourage athletes to drink. That's not necessarily the case, but um, for most it is. 15 minutes before, you should see your athletes sipping on, whether it's water, uh, sport drink, depending on the type of activity or environment that you're in. They really should be topping up there to make sure they're hydrated before the session and making sure your athletes are drinking every 15 to 20 minutes. So whether that's um, scheduled drink breaks, if that's possible for what whatever the exercise is that you're doing, or just noting that your athletes uh, are frequently ducking out or just grabbing a quick mouthful every 15 minutes is going to be really important to minimize that uh, effect of dehydration at the end of that training period. And immediately post, it's quite a bit of fluid that athletes might need depending on how much body weight they have lost, uh, if that's something they ever calculated, but one and a half liters per kilogram of body weight loss. And they really need to then continue to drink for the next 24 hours or so because it can take up to 36 to completely rehydrate. And if your athletes are starting that next training session in a dehydrated state, the performance just keeps getting impaired. They're not getting as much out of the next training session. They're tired. They're cramping. They have headaches. So just making sure that your athletes are fully hydrated starting every training session is really important. So um, I want to talk a little bit about fueling for performance. So that's looking at our sorry pre, during, and post. So it's, uh, I think it's great for when coaches ask their athletes when they come in for a session or um, leading into competition, have you eaten before you come in, noting what they are doing during, whether that's food and or fluid, and then uh, ensuring that they're all getting something to, to snack on right after is really important. Because a lot of athletes either don't know what they should be doing um, or forget to pack. So having that reminder, having the, the coach really um, encouraging uh, encouraging what they're doing in around training is going to be really critical for maximizing every session that they have. So we want to make sure that they have uh, adequate energy levels. They're full. They feel good for training or whatever their exercise is. Um, they're comfortable in their gut though, and then refueling and rebuilding. So up leading up to the next training session. So if we look at before training, what should your athletes be doing? What can they be eating? So if we're looking at three to four hours uh, before, we can go to the next slide, sorry, Natasha. Thanks. So the basically, the further out they are from training, the larger the, the snack or the meal can be because they have more time for digestion. So checking in with your athletes, uh, depending on the time of uh, training in the day, can dictate what they're going to be having. If it's three to four hours, they could have had a full meal, looking at a high carb option. Um, some moderate protein and low fat and fiber. So whatever they want to have for a good quality meal will likely suffice um, to maintain their energy levels uh, before training. The reason we're going to look at lower fat and fiber uh, would be because of the time it takes to digest those nutrients. As we get closer to a, a training or an event, we want to decrease that amount of fat and fiber to pretty much nothing, and then the protein will actually start to decrease as well. Again, just it takes long um, to digest those nutrients, and this can delay any gastric emptying, and that can really leave an athlete feeling sluggish, um, which ultimately can impair uh, what they're doing. So 
moderate snack a couple hours out and then if they're doing uh, if they want to top up glycogen stores or if it's been a while since their last meal then they want to have a little something about 30 minutes before so that's just a light snack so really focusing at that point in time on carbohydrates and fluids so if they're coming in uh, doing a warm-up and you've checked in with them to see if they've had anything maybe they can you know maybe it's like they pull out a banana and a little bit of water to fuel up before training and that would suffice to to top them off so what should they be doing during well they might not be doing anything other than water and that could be fine it's really going to depend on the type of exercise that they're involved in and um, and how they feel so not every athlete's going to be able to eat even if they're training for a number of hours and that has just it has to do with gut comfort so we have to find things that work for each athlete on an individual basis but as a general as a general recommendation I do talk to athletes about making sure that they have adequate fluid so that's first and foremost and as I said water is going to be sufficient for many things so brief exercise less than 45 minutes water is completely fine if it's anything more intense or maybe longer than that or it's really hot we might start needing to look at getting carbohydrates in there as well so whether that does come from food or comes from something like a sport drink um, that's where that would fall into place and even something like mouth rinsing um, can be effective we've seen that in uh, hockey players and, and other athletes and they try that and really just kind of stimulates parts of the brain and, and the central nervous system to enhance perception of really feeling well uh, and increase the work output so it's kind of tricking the mind a little bit that carbohydrates are coming you're going to be able to um, do the next bout of exercise but you really wouldn't actually have to ingest it so they could just rinse and kind of spit out and if you have endurance athletes looking at one to two and a half hours of activity, they're actually going to need a good amount of carbohydrates uh, for every hour that they're exercising. So um, being mindful that your athletes have a source of carbohydrates with them and that they have time to eat that. So whether it's fruit, um, as you can see, I have a picture of a fruit leather there. Those are often um, digested well. Um, applesauce packets. So uh, I talk to athletes all the time about getting the, the baby, I call them baby squishies, but the the organic applesauce, but in different flavors that you can get at um, the grocery stores. They pack really well. They're easy to eat. So uh, athletes often find those really helpful. Uh, any and sports drink as well could also apply in there. If you have an athlete that isn't, uh, isn't so good with eating food, granola bars, anything like that can be um, helpful to maintain their energy levels throughout uh, long endurance exercise. So when we look at recovery, that's really, really important to make sure that your athletes are maximizing every, every training session that they're undergoing with you. So all your athletes, hopefully, uh, should be having something packed with them, especially if they have a drive, because our window of opportunity is really about 20 to 30 minutes with an activity to maximize refueling all the the glycogen stores they depleted so we want to replace carbohydrates as well as rebuilding that protein so for the muscles that were broken down and utilized um, in training we need to make sure that they're totally repaired as well so we have we have about a 30 minute window where it's the most optimal that's not to say that they can't um, recover within excuse me an hour to an hour and a half later but if they have adequate nutrition packed with them then they're really really getting the best uh, best out of their training. So again, checking in with athletes, seeing if they are taking the time during cool down or before they leave, pulling stuff out of their bags to recover uh, can be a good way to make sure that they're fully, um, fully getting everything out of their training so that they can really feel their performance. Um, how much? So a four to one ratio of carbs to protein. A lot of athletes definitely focus on the protein. They usually have no problem meeting that. Carbohydrates are often either missed entirely or just do not get enough. So knowing that actually needs to be in a ratio higher than protein can be important for your athletes to know. Again, it is based on body weight uh, and the type of exercise. So really the take home here is just to know that they do need both carbohydrate and protein um, to meet their needs uh, and then fluid as well. Whey protein we know is the most optimal protein for muscle protein synthesis so if we're looking at trying to build and retain lean muscle in your athletes then whey protein is important so dairy products are going to be 
your source of whey. So chocolate milk is in fact a good recovery. So if they're bringing that after a, a hard workout, there's nothing wrong with that. White milk is fine, maybe Greek yogurt. Um, whether or not they have a place to keep these things cold may be the issue with bringing them, but uh, hopefully those are the things that they uh, will be able to eat. Just a few food choices on the next slide here, just to give um, coaches some ideas or examples of what athletes could be bringing if they if they ask and they're not really sure what I should be doing or or what things you could recommend, if anything. Um, some things like a peanut butter sandwich, a cup of milk, uh, some fruit. So we know fruit and grains are going to be providing the most uh, carbohydrates per serving. So anything fruit or grain based are usually a go-to. Now I tell athletes, things like meal replacement drinks actually are fantastic that way. So Ensure Boost, um, there's some Oasis Sport, there's a new uh, Power Pour I think out there. So there's a few of these meal replacements that can actually work quite well. Maybe they do homemade smoothies, uh, cottage cheese is great. And then we really want to make sure that they're having uh, that second recovery because um, it's a two stage, two stage process, sorry. So within one to two hours, <clears throat> depending on the time of the activity, they're going to go home and eat with lunch or maybe they go home and have dinner with families. Making sure that uh, they are following up and having something after that is really important. So I see that I'm getting close to time, so I just have a couple items left. Um, helping your athletes. Uh, know that they really do need to help the plan and prepare ahead of time is going to be key for their success in meeting their nutritional needs, uh, both in quantity and quality. So uh, that's a lot of the, um, I don't want to say excuses, but the challenges that I hear athletes have is, oh, you know, I, I didn't bring my recovery or I was running late or I didn't have lunch back, but helping them understand that it does take a little bit of planning, you know, helping get parents on board uh, with with helping their athletes plan and pack ahead or um, doing team nutrition kits when when uh, there's um, when they're traveling doing competitions on the road things like that can be really really helpful for ensuring athletes are meeting uh, all their needs so you know thinking about high carb snacks um, moderate sources of protein making sure they have fluids and then uh, you know just helping educate them when they are out uh, on the road uh, on what choices would be the best and then looking at that sort of plate visual that I that I had earlier on how to meet their overall energy needs um, can be helpful when you are traveling so that's just a quick bit on that and then how can athlete or sorry how can coaches uh, and parents <coughs> excuse me uh, really play a role other than you know basic education and and uh, and you know um, turning athletes to to dietitians and, and people like us that can help uh, on an individual basis. But I think that coaches can really uh, be a role model with, with their own uh, personal nutrition choices. So athletes are with coaches quite a lot. When coaches uh, model healthy eating behaviors or habits, um, I think their athletes can really, can really look up to them then. So they really do need knowledge and the support to develop these healthy relationships with food. This is a, an interesting um, age group where like you know we saw some of those stats before where fast food is really prevalent sugary drinks are appealing there's the social pressures of eating a certain way with friends and peers but as adolescents and as athletes it's really critical that they develop these really healthy relationships with food now so that they can maximize just not their performance but become really healthy adults as well so I think modeling that as a coach and a parent can be really important. Um, talking about po positive body image can be really, really critical as well, especially for um, especially for our female athletes. Not that it's not important for males, but um, more times or not, we see the negative body image uh, being spoken in female athletes. We want to encourage our athletes uh, and, and kids really to do things like contribute to grocery shopping or potentially cooking at home. So talking to parents about how their athletes can get involved, uh, again, packing their own lunch or uh, having um, developing those snack ideas on their own can be really helpful in developing those habits so they're being accountable to their own nutrition. Um, you know, ensure healthy food is being offered at team parties. So if, if we're trying to develop this culture of healthy eating, so, um, encouraging that and supporting that at events, group events is really going to help 
um, build those healthy relationships. And then giving suggestions for uh, building healthy team nutrition kits for travel. And the, the suggestions I would, uh, I would ask to come from athletes. So getting them involved with how they can um, help, how they can build their own nutrition kit or the um, what stops that they might, you might need to make along the way or what you can do when you get to where you need to be if you are traveling. So get them involved in that. And then always encouraging them to choose the healthy, healthiest option when eating on the road. Not all athletes are going to do that all the time, but I think certainly encouraging them and supporting that choice is really important. Just a few sum up points. Um, so bottom line, uh, quality, obviously very important. We did talk about that. Um, your athletes really need to be eating every two to three hours to get all of the energy that they need. Um, we saw the plates. So balancing those meals is really important. So talking to your athletes about what quality food looks like. Um, again, the, the food guide is a good um, starting block. Uh, I can show them where they can get carbs, protein, and fats, looking at three to four food groups at each meal, and that can reference the food groups for them. And then two to three food groups at each snack. Uh, I always tell athletes is the, probably the easiest way for them to be able to, to get all of those micronutrients that they need. If they have that variety in there, then it's a lot easier making sure that they're well hydrated. So tell them to check their pee regularly. It should be something they should all be looking at uh, and it can take a long time to fully rehydrate. So making sure they have time in training to get those drinks, um, potentially using sports drinks if that's what's needed and making sure they're planning ahead, packing that uh, recovery snack. So they should be pulling that out at the end of training, ideally, unless they live really, really close and they're driving home right for dinner. Um, or whatever the meal might be, and then they encourage them to be eating whenever, wherever they can. So change room, sidelines, then the car on the way home, making sure that they're topping up throughout training if that's what they need. So that's sort of my, my quick list of take-homes. Thank you very much, uh, and I'll certainly take any questions through Natasha. Yeah, thank you so much, Erin. That was awesome. Um, so yeah, if you guys will open it up to questions, so if you want to type in the chat box there, um, if you have to run, thank you for coming, but if not, yeah, stick around for a few questions, and I thought that was great, Erin, I think, you know, as a coach, it doesn't matter what training you've done in this area, it's always a good reminder, and I loved your plate breakouts of, you know, what does it look like for a light, moderate, and heavy day, so it was great. Thanks, Natasha. So you're... Yeah, no problem. So your first, or you have two questions coming in right away. Um, first one says, just wondering about uh, fueling after a night practice until 10 p.m. Uh, sorry, and then there's more. And then having a morning practice at 7.30 a.m. Should I recommend sport drinks? So recommend sport drinks for recovery, specifically? So I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Yes. Yes. She's saying yes. Okay. Um, so if, if they can do a more whole source of food, uh, given that late at night, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea um, as opposed to a sport drink. If that's really all that they um, can do at that point in time, um, whether it's gut comfort or whatnot, uh, that's fine because they will get the carbohydrate and the fluid replacement there. But, uh, you know, that, that is a great question. I think at that late at night, if they're able to do it through, uh, through Whole Foods, that's probably a bit better of an option, especially where they will be going to, to bed likely shortly right after that. Yeah, I think that's a tough one. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Erin. Um, so the next one says, sorry, just a second, for some reason it's scrolling really funny. Mm -hmm. um, as a coach in a sport with weight classes, how can one approximately address questions about losing weight around and prior to competition times? Yeah. Is that one that maybe is better covered in our next webinar, or, or if yeah, not, go for it, Aaron? Yeah, probably. It, it is definitely a bit more specific. Um, and yeah, I, I think Natasha, that that would be a great question uh, leading to the to the second webinar. But um, definitely note that one for sure. Yeah. So Kayla, sorry, I know you missed uh, just our intro, but we are going to do a follow up webinar in the fall. So what we do want to hear from you guys, if you have them, is those those questions. So like, I will add this one to our topics for Aaron for the fall. 
Um, so Shannon is saying, any thoughts on trying to get an athlete to eat on competition day and dealing with nerves? Yeah, that's a good one. That is a really good one. And a lot of the times it, it athletes, what we want athletes to try is, um, certain foods that make them feel comfortable in training and practice that. So, uh, if you have any sort of, um, mock competitions or anything that athletes can try certain foods that feel comfortable for them, getting them to stick with those foods is really, really critical. Um, if they don't have anything that ever sits well, cause there are some athletes that will have the nerves no matter what, uh, oftentimes fluid, um, fluid calories would be, uh, the next go-to. So things that will probably digest quicker, not sit so heavy, uh, and will have less issues with nerves, but again, finding foods that are comfortable for them is our number one. And then looking at, uh, sort of fluid calories after that would be, would be the next recommendation. Yeah, that's a tough one for a lot of athletes. Thanks, Erin. Okay, does anyone else have any other questions? Okay, we can keep typing them on. Erin and I will stay on for another few minutes for sure. Um, I did send a couple of you guys some messages. Uh, add a manual if you're still online. I think you are. I just sent you one. So some of you guys I couldn't find in the, the CAC coaching locker, so I sent you a message. Um, so if you could just, if you don't see it in your chat, if you could just kind of tap your name and find it, that would help me. Um, and otherwise, yeah, we'll stay online if you have some more questions. I want to thank you guys again for attending. Uh, if you have any topic ideas in nutrition that you'd like to hear in the fall, please send them to myself. Um, and, uh, and I'll send a follow-up email out to this group. But send it to me so we can start building up what Aaron will talk about in the fall. And uh, again, these are going to kind of finish off now until September. But we'll be back in September with lots of new and exciting free webinars. And, uh, and we'll be bringing Erin back. She did an awesome.